one of my favorite areas to dive into, especially lately. I feel like a lot of my clients um, are kind of in that prenatal trying to get pregnant era. I don't really know if it's just what's been <laughs> gravitating my way or if uh, it's a COVID babies are kind of really starting to come to people's forefront. Everyone's done with the COVID puppies and now we're moving on to COVID babies. Um, and I love talking about it because I have obviously my own experience when it comes to fertility issues. Um, my partner and I did get pregnant back in the fall. Um, full transparency, it was unintentional. Uh, and we ended up miscarrying and we had what was called a blighted ovum. Um, basically what my, means that happened there is there were just nothing grew. So after that, I kind of really started to take my fertility a little bit more seriously. I've always taken my hormone health very seriously. I've had a history of hormone issues, irregular cycles caused by stress. I really need to change that uh, sweaty spin class, love of a sweaty spin class in my bios because I do love them, but they do not love my body. That's for sure. Um, so I've had a long history of trying to figure out my own hormones um, and trying to figure out my own fertility. So it's something that I talk to a lot of people about, and I'm really excited to talk to everybody today about it. And as was mentioned, if you have any questions, please toss them into the chat box. Um, we are more than excited to talk about them and we'll probably hold them off till the end. And I do want to kind of get a sense. I know I, know, I saw one question, where is everybody from? If you can also toss in the... Tell me where your level of energy is at today. How are you feeling? Give me like a one to 10 along with where you're from. Um, you know, did you have a great day? Did you have a horrible day? Are you dying from this heat or are you absolutely loving it? Um, I know, yeah, me personally, I love and hate the heat all at the same time. But I am going to get started so we don't have to wait too long. So first off, a huge thank you to Nature's Fair. I absolutely love doing these ones. Um, as was already mentioned, I've done a couple of these and you guys are always amazing. You're really engaged. I love the questions. You're always really on it. So definitely toss them in there. Keep it going. I love the conversation. I am going to try to keep this to about 40. I'm going to try to keep this a short webinar. I could go on forever. Um, but I do want to make sure that we have lots of time for questions. And a little bit about Organica. So obviously I'm here on behalf of Organica. Um, Organica is a natural wellness company from beautiful BC. We actually are located just outside of Vancouver. So we're just in Richmond. We have two um, office, well not offices, but one manufacturing facility and then one head office in there as well. And we've been helping people live healthier for almost 31 years. So we actually have our 31st birthday in August. Um, and it was started by a man named Tom Chin. It is now run by his two sons, Aaron and Jordan Chin. And they've gone from a very small and humble line of supplements to, I don't even know how many are on the roster anymore. There's a lot. And it goes from everything from fun superfood powders to a lot of the ones we're actually going to dive into today where they have a lot more of those therapeutic benefits. And a little bit about myself, as was already mentioned, I am an RHN and I practice at Integrative Naturopathic Medical Center. That was a mouthful, so great job. Um, and I get to see a lot of clients on a regular basis, specifically around hormone health. That's why we're here today in fertility, gut health, which also ties right back into fertility and hormone health, weight management, as well as mental health. And I also help to like to help people love living healthy. I want them to find a balance in being able to have a glass of wine, but also being able to feel really good about their food choices most of the time. Because let's be real, like everyone does take it every once in a while. We got to support local right now. A quick note that I always like to make sure that I cover here is this is for um, you know, informational purposes only. This isn't here as a diagnostic tool. If you do have specific questions about your fertility health, your hormone health, sometimes it, I might not be able to answer a question because I need a little bit more background information. So sometimes you will want to consult with your healthcare provider, whether or not that's a uh, GP, your naturopathic doctor, or your nutritionist. And what are we going to get into today? So we're going to dive into what the heck are your hormones? I think we didn't get the greatest teaching of it uh, in elementary schools and high schools. I don't know about you guys, but I definitely did not. 
Um, we're going to talk about tracking ovulation because that's another thing. No, you cannot get pregnant every single day of your cycle. Uh, we're going to talk about the importance of your hormones. So even if you are someone that is not trying to actively conceive right now, it is really important to understand your hormone health and still understand that ovulation. And then we're going to dive into some of the hormone issues that might be impacting your fertility or even sustaining a pregnancy. Um, and then creating quality sperm because at the end of the day, it is not just the person who can carry the baby. It is also the person who carries the sperm. And there's a lot that we can do on both ends. And then we're going to dive into supplements, food, tips and tricks because um, there are definitely a couple of supplements that I will recommend for a lot of people. So first off, why should you even, why should you care about your hormones? What do they matter at all? Uh, good hormone health isn't just about your ability to conceive. When you have regulated hormones, you're going to have better sleep. You're going to have increased energy. You'll have more focus. We'll see a little bit better weight management, um, reduce cravings, beauty aspect of it. A lot of times we'll see people start prematurely aging when our hormones are not in balance. Uh, you know, those deep lines, wrinkles, that can be related back to our estrogen levels. You'll have less painful menstrual cycles and increased libido. And I think like looking at that list, I'd want all of those things. And there's often times where people will come to me and be like, you know, I have all of these issues and we can't, we don't necessarily always go back to our hormone health. We don't always necessarily realize that there's something going on with our hormones. We might think that it's a digestive issue. We might think that, you know, I'm just tired. It's the kids, it's my work schedule, but oftentimes there's something underlying that we need to actually start addressing. So your hormones during your cycle, let's kind of give a quick review of what happens. And like I said, I don't think we necessarily got the best lesson. Uh, we were told, you know, you get your period and that's what happens once a month. We never, and we talked about, you know, how the egg develops and all that stuff, depending on which science classes you took. But we didn't necessarily get into what happens when you get your period through the month. So we have some key hormones that we want to be looking at. Estrogen in the form of estradiol, progesterone, luteinizing hormone, which I'll also call your LH, uh, follicle follicle stimulating hormone, which is also FSH. And then our cycle is broken down into four phases, our follicular phase, ovulation phase, luteal phase, and menstruation. I also call menstruation your bleeding phase. I find it's a little bit more literal because we call our menstrual cycle, we have our, you know, it's we call it our menstrual cycle. So sometimes it gets a little bit confusing. So if I refer to it as your bleeding phase at any time during the presentation, just know that's what I'm talking about. Um, with our hormones, so if you actually look just on the, what does it say? Ovarian hormones, that's what we're looking at. Um, we notice that our estradiol, so that's our estrogen, is going to peak in the first half. So that is going to peak during the follicular phase. Then we see a drop, and then we see an increase in our progesterone, and that happens during your luteal phase. Your ovulation is marked by that significant drop in your estrogen and your menstruation or your bleeding phase is dropped by that or is marked by that significant drop in both your progesterone and your estradiol. Now, what ends up happening for a lot of people is the estradiol and the progesterone or your estrogen and your progesterone are going to be out of balance, which is oftentimes what's causing a lot of these hormonal issues. And we are going to dive into that in a couple of slides. The other thing I wanted to highlight here is your body temperature. So what you'll notice is your body temperature actually spikes when you ovulate. So the, if you're someone who's done basal body temperature tracking, if you're you know, trying to do it for fertility, or maybe if you've been recommended it by someone else for thyroid health tracking, what you'll notice is the day that you have ovulated, your temperature will then spike. So if you're tracking your fertility, trying to use your basal body temperature, just remember, it's really important to notice the patterns month over month, rather than just assume that you'll be able to try to conceive the day that your your um, your body temperature spikes. And it's such a minute amount. I always recommend people use a 0.2 decimal place thermometer to get a more accurate picture. Another thing I actually wanted to say before I change slides, I almost just skipped this part. When we're looking at your four phases, one of the things I actually always like to equate it to, and this can help you to 
understand maybe how to live on a regular basis. If you're someone that doesn't have any major underlying health issues, but you notice that you're, you know, you get your period and you kind of start to feel a little bit more blah. And we live in a society where we're told we need to be on it all the time. We need to be, you know, always productive. We can't be slacking. We can't be tired. But if you look at how our phases are broken down, I like to equate the follicular phase to your springtime, ovulation to your summer, luteal phase to your fall, and menstruation to your winter. So your follicular phase is that time where you're kind of starting to wake up. This is that post period, or maybe the last little bit of your, of your bleeding phase. And you're waking up, you're feeling a little bit more like yourself, you're more focused, you can actually do things, you're wanting to do things again. Ovulation is that time where you're feeling extra spicy. So you are feeling fine, you are loving the way you look, you can put on whatever you want, and you're like, this is when you're, you know, your libido's the highest, that's for sure. And then we look at our luteal phase, and this is that time, again, where we kind of start to hunker down. This is when we hit that fall phase. Maybe we slow down our exercises. Maybe we internalize a little bit more, and we can change up our work schedule to, to, to focus more on those, um, you know, kind of solitude, computer skills, not really doing a ton of meetings if you have that kind of control. Um, and then we have menstruation, which is our winter. This is that hibernation. You want to focus on a lot more grounding foods. You want to focus on iron-rich foods, all of that kind of stuff. Now, how do you know when you ovulate? It's not always on this day 14 of your menstrual cycle type deal. So sometimes what we're told is, um, you know, you have a 28 day cycle. If you're tracking your period using an ovulation or using a period tracker, you may be assuming that on day 14 of your cycle, you are going to get your period or you're going to ovulate. This is not always the case. You can ovulate anywhere from typically like 12 to 16 days is the average before you get your period. So this means if you're on a 28 day cycle, you might be ovulating anywhere from day, my math isn't gonna be good with this one, oh no. If you're on a 28 day cycle, day 12 to day 18, my math might've been totally off, I'm sorry guys, that was terrible. Uh, but there's a bigger window there. And like I said, you cannot get pregnant every day of your cycle. So you need to know the day you ovulate and you have a short window, typically three to five days max, um, that you're going to be able to conceive during that time. So tracking ovulation can be harder if you have any regular period. So trying to use something like an ovulation predictor kit, that's just you pee on a stick, it tells you what your LH levels are. So that's that luteinizing hormone that we looked at or that we had in the last slide. I'm going to pop back really quickly that spikes when we ovulate. So you're gonna get a spike and then immediately afterward, you will be ovulating within likely the next 24 hours. So typically once you get that, that's kind of when you want to um, focus on having intercourse. You can also feel it. Like I said, you have more energy, you have a better mood, you're more communicative, you want to be more intimate with your partner. So a lot of the time too, one of the biggest things you can try to do um, is start actually recognizing your your feelings. Don't try to bury whatever is going on. Try to get more in tune with your body on a daily basis. So knowing when you knowing when you ovulate um, isn't only important for timing intercourse. It's also important to understand the length of your follicular and your luteal phases. And this is especially important because if you have a short luteal phase, so let's say you ovulate on day 20 and you get your period on day 28. That means that your luteal phase window isn't giving you enough time to get the progesterone that you need in order to necessarily sustain a pregnancy. So if you are having low progesterone, which we're gonna talk about soon, this may be identified by a short luteal phase window. And that can mean that we're going to have difficulty sustaining a pregnancy and it may lead to early miscarriage. So a couple of problems that can hinder our fertility our thyroid health, PCOS, which I think a lot of us have started to hear about more often, so that's polycystic ovarian syndrome, endometriosis, unexplained irregular cycles, so that's your menstrual cycle, high stress life, and a lack of sleep. So this is one of the biggest ones that you actually have a lot more control over than you think. An inappropriate exercise routine. So when I say inappropriate, I'm not talking like you're doing something like you know, stripping or whatever. Like I know that everyone has their own exercise routine, 
But what I mean by inappropriate, I mean, you're not doing the exercises that are appropriate for your body. For some people, endurance running is fine. For other people, you can't run 5k every day without messing up your hormones. Some people, a spin class is totally fine. For others, like myself, a spin class a day, you lose your period. So everyone is so different. So it means finding the appropriate exercise routine for you. Trying to conceive immediately post pill. So another thing we're going to be talking about is how oral uh, birth control pill, hormonal contraception, so that's the Mirena, Kylena, any of those IUDs might actually hinder your ability to conceive immediately afterward. Not truly understanding your cycle. We did just talk about that a little bit when we got into the ovulation. Genetics. Um, I often will recommend that people do get some genetic testing done if you're hitting that window of, okay, we've been trying to conceive for, I, I usually tell people, yes, 12 months, start talking to someone, but the regular, the actual average is 18 months that it can take people to try to conceive. Also your age, your age is going to play a role. We do know that as we start to age, our estrogen levels start to drop, our eggs start to change. So it's really important that we also know what we're getting into at the, the age of conception. One quick note is there's going to be some issues that are going to require more intervention than others. Um, I'm going to talk specifically today about thyroid health, um, PCOS, endometriosis, just general low progesterone, high estrogen, which kind of falls under that unexplained irregular cycles. Um, and we're gonna talk about trying to conceive immediately post pill. So a couple of things that I always have people try to look out for. And I call this trimester zero because we have trimester one, obviously, as that first trimester of getting pregnant. Two, three, trimester four is now what we know as those first three months post-pregnancy, or yeah, post-pregnancy, so once you've had your baby. But trimester zero is that period of time before you actually conceive. This is the time where you start to get your body in check, where you start learning about what's going on in your body in order to conceive um, ideally more readily in order to have a more successful pregnancy. So a few questions to ask yourself before you start trying. Do I have severe PMS, mood swings, breast tenderness, pre-period cramping or cravings? Do I have painful periods? How long do my periods last? What's the color of my menstrual blood? When do I actually ovulate? So we talked about that one. How much caffeine am I drinking on a regular basis? If you're someone living off coffee, not only is that going to change your stress hormones, but if you do get pregnant, you got to cut that back anyway. So you might as well start getting that control under now, under control now. How often am I craving sweet foods or carbohydrates that can lead to blood sugar imbalances. That's also important to really get under check before we, before we start trying to conceive. So we don't end up leading to issues later on in our pregnancy. Do I have unexplained weight gain, hair loss, fatigue? This could also say uh, hair gain as we're gonna get into when I talk about PCOS in a minute. So these are some things that you can keep at the back of your head and even ask yourself this now, because these are all things that mean that there is likely a hormone imbalance that is happening in your body. And I would say most of the women in my practice um, are dealing with some kind of hormone imbalance. So let's chat about your thyroid health. So hyper and hypothyroid conditions can cause cycle irregularity. I'm going to today talk about hypothyroidism. I'm going to talk about um, an underactive thyroid because this is more common for women that I see. What happens when we're looking at our thyroid? So our hypothalamus lets off TRH, um, and our from our from our from that from the TRH we have our anterior pituitary gland, uh, which is then going to release TSH. TSH is that thyroid stimulating hormone. If you've ever had a blood test, you know that that's what they're testing for. That TSH triggers our thyroid to then release T4 and T3. Now, the downside of thyroid testing, so if you think that there's something wrong with your thyroid and you go to your doctor, the downside of this thyroid testing is oftentimes our doctors will only test for TSH. Now, the negative side of that is there's often times where our TSH levels can actually be in normal range. And I also quote normal because the normal range from a doctor's perspective is going to be different from the normal range or the optimal range from a naturopathic doctor's perspective. Um, so just as a reminder, when you are looking at your, your TSH levels, it might be a good idea to get a second pair of eyes on that. 
Now, um, oftentimes what then happens is if you cannot get your T4 and your T3 tested, we're going off your TSH levels and that doesn't always give us the accurate picture. Your T4 and your T3 can also be low even when your TSH levels are in the proper range. So it is important to, you know, maybe see someone who works more in the natural world of medicine um, if you want to get an accurate picture, especially if you're, if you've noticed that you have a lot of the symptoms like cold hands and feet, you have chronic constipation, uh, you're having really bad brain fog or difficulty concentrating, you have a really bad inability to lose weight, like you feel like you've tried every diet under the sun and it's not working. Uh, you may have irregular cycles with this, so more prolonged cycles typically. And thyroid issues in, in males can also impact the quality of their sperm. So understanding your thyroid health can be really important. Next up is PCOS, so polycystic ovarian syndrome. Um, at least in my world, I definitely know that this has been more of the forefront. So some of the things or the symptoms that you may be experiencing if you're dealing with PCOS, it's irregular cycles, male pattern hair. So this often will look like, like some people will literally have a beard. They will have full chin hair that is thick. It looks like they would may probably shave it. Um, often, oftentimes people can have it on their face or chest or even their abdomen. I have seen some people have also actually had it on their shoulders as well. Um, unexplained weight gain or an inability to lose weight. Typically we're seeing it around your abdomen. So oftentimes what we see for people is, um, what you'll call like kind of a sugar belly where it's, it really kind of sits around that, that tummy area, male pattern, baldness or thinning hair, skin tags, skin tags are often also related to issues with insulin resistance. Um, and cysts on the ovary. So that's that classic, when we think of something like polycystic ovarian syndrome, you would assume that there's going to be cysts on ovaries. Not always the case though. So your doctor may recommend an ultrasound to identify your cysts on your ovaries, but this is not necessarily always accurate. Um, you can get blood tests for things like fasting glucose, fasting insulin, and androsinodione or your different androgens. Um, that's those, that's those male male hormones, so things like testosterone and that kind of stuff, which is typically elevated in people with PCOS, and those are some of the common common things we'll see. Endometriosis, so common symptoms include dysmenorrhea, so we're looking at oftentimes really irregular cycles, and this can be um, one of the biggest indicators for, for endometriosis. Chronic pelvic pain, so not just having pelvic pain during your period, but you're having it regularly painful intercourse, severe menstrual pain, irregular flow or premenstrual spotting. Oftentimes endometriosis is not actually, is, is not um, diagnosed until you've had, until you've been diagnosed with infertility. So oftentimes it comes down to our fertility and our trying to conceive, where we actually find out that we've had endometriosis because a lot of people will have it in different levels and different ways. Some people will have very little pain, other people will have chronic pain, and it doesn't always line up necessarily the exact same every month. It's typically overseen by a medical, medical professional and can include hormone support. Um, some people will deal with surgical procedures depending on your age or your symptoms, and we may have assisted need to look into assisted reproduction uh, in order to actually work with someone with endometriosis who is trying to conceive. So one of the biggest ones I do want to talk about is your low progesterone and or high estrogen. When we're looking at this, depending on your issues and depending on your age, you may be recommended doing bioidentical hormones to provide additional support. So you typically will be getting this from your doctor or your naturopathic doctor. Um, they are able to recommend it. They are able to prescribe this type of thing for you. It does require a prescription in order for you to get it. Common symptoms can include things like your irregular menstrual cycle, so it's either a really short or a long one, heavy and painful periods, PMS, painful and swollen breasts, mood swings, brown colored period blood. It can also necessarily be, um, you know, kind of on that very long spectrum. Some people will have very light pink. Um, some people can have totally normal colored period blood, but also be dealing with all these other symptoms. A lot of people find um, one supplement called Chase Berry that can be helpful to regulate hormone support. Um, Organica doesn't specifically have that, but I do like to make sure that I recommend it. And I'm sure that Nature's Fair has um, it from one brand, that's for sure. Um, 
And oftentimes too, I do find that adding in something like Chase Berry can be really helpful in that second phase, especially for someone actually that we realize that that um, luteal phase, like I mentioned before, is shorter because that is going to help you to actually conceive. You want to make sure that that luteal phase is strong. You want to get that progesterone up in a natural way. Um, so if you are someone that is experiencing what seems like low progesterone, um, adding something like that in can be really helpful. Now I have low progesterone and or high estrogen because oftentimes for people, we have a combination or one or the other. So some people can have regular progesterone -ish, regular progesterone levels, but then high estrogen. Others might have regular estrogen levels and low progesterone. And sometimes we have high estrogen and low progesterone. I talk about this because it's more common to see um, what's called estrogen dominance. So that's high estrogen to progesterone ratio than it is to see high progesterone, low estrogen. Um, that also will depend on your age. So if you're in the kind of area of trying to conceive, typically we'll see low progesterone or high estrogen um, as you kind of start to age and move more into that meta, those menopausal years, we'll start to see that estrogen drop. Contraception. Okay, so I do want to talk about this one because many people believe that you can come off oral contraception, hormonal, IUDs, and you can get pregnant immediately. Yes, there are people like that. But we want to look at, remember that slide from the very beginning that showed how our estrogen was spiking in the beginning and then drops and then our progesterone spikes and then both of them drop? This is what our hormones look like when we are taking contraception, hormonal contraception specifically. Our hormones are regulated the whole month. And then when we stop taking the pill, so when you have that, like, I'm gonna use the pill as the example just because it's the easiest one to talk about. Um, when you have that pack and then you have those like five days where you have the placebo pills, that's when your hormones drop off and that's what mimics a period. So when you have your oral contraception, oral contraception or your IUD, you are never actually ovulating. So your body needs to learn how to do all that all over again. And oftentimes people will, will have what's called post pill PCOS. So they will have all of the symptoms of PCOS and they will occur immediately after they've come off the pill. They'll have irregular cycles. So I'll give myself as an example. I had major cystic acne. I wasn't getting my period for like, I think it was like six months at a time that I would get it. Um, and sorry, I would get it every six months. I didn't have it for six months long. That would be the worst. Um, so, and it took a long time for everything to regulate again. So oftentimes what we need to do when we come off of the pill is look at doing some type of cleanse. We need to make sure that our diet is in check in order for everything to start regulating. Oftentimes I will have the conversation with people. If you are trying to, you think you will be trying to conceive in the next year, come off the pill sooner rather than later. Um, it's a really good idea to give yourself at least a year to, to regulate your period again, especially if you went on the pill for an irregular cycle to begin with. If you were put on the pill for, yeah, for you in a regular cycle, for acne, for anything aside from prevention, it's typically a good idea to get off just because uh, some of that, those issues might still be underlying. And creating quality sperm. So like I mentioned, it is not just about the egg. Quality sperm is, success, is successful, uh, is essential for a successful pregnancy. So I, I'm going to say sperm person because I obviously don't know all the people that are on here right now. I don't know your situation. Um, so I, it may not be a dad. So we're just going to talk about it as a sperm person. So what can impact the sperm quality? Antioxidant intake can protect the sperm. High stress can reduce the quality of our sperm. Vitamin D and zinc can be really, really great for supplements in order to support the sperm quality. I also will typically recommend CoQ10 as well. Regular exercise that reduces stress can be supportive. So if you have a partner or you have a donor, whatever we're looking at, who is very highly active um, and it actually is causing them more damage on their stress levels, we might be seeing issues with their sperm quality as well. 
excessive alcohol consumption, poor sleep, and tobacco use, um, as well as marijuana use, can all hinder sperm quality too. So a couple of general tips to support your fertility journey. Blood sugar regulation is key. So this is really important for my people out there dealing with PCOS um, and any kind of hormone imbalance, specifically if we're looking at that high low progesterone issue. Um, and if we're looking at PCOS, typically blood sugar regulation can be super beneficial for us. Um, I talk about blood sugar so often. So we want to start our day with protein, fat, and fiber. And when I'm talking about fiber, I'm talking about typically a lower carb fiber. Um, so leafy greens, something like chia pudding or flax seeds. These are going to be beneficial because you really want to start your day on a good foot. We want to manage our stress levels. So what can you control versus what can't you control? Um, what stress management tools can you implement? and then seek counseling services when needed. So oftentimes we're not realizing how stressed we are in a day-to-day -day basis. So making sure that we are seeking those counseling services when we need. Quality sleep, seven to nine hours is ideal. Um, that is going to be super helpful for you if you are in a position where you already have little ones laying around and they are not going to be able to let you sleep seven to nine hours. Try your best to get as much as you can. Patience. This is an annoying one to hear, and so I'm sorry that I'm adding it, but I need to. Um, the average family does take around 18 months to conceive. So if you are hitting that 18 month mark, that is kind of the time where you can really start to push a doctor or a naturopath or whatever. Um, and even around that 12 mark, because it does get frustrating to month over month, see a negative pregnancy test. Um, but again, making sure that, you know, you are, um, trying to show yourself a little patience and a little bit of gratitude for everything your body is trying to do. And then be informed to the point that makes you confident, but not scared. This is my personal tip that I add on there because of my personal experiences. Um, I found it really easy for myself to move through the trauma of a miscarriage because I was previously more informed. Um, I didn't go into it naive and thinking that everything was going to be totally fine. I went into it with a little bit more of a, I've had friends that have dealt with it. I know the risks, I know the rates of miscarriage. So for me personally, uh, that was really helpful. So I do always encourage people to know, but not know too much that's gonna scare you uh, because there's a lot of information out there. Do not go down, go down that Google rabbit hole. It's not fun, uh, but just give yourself at least a little bit of information and talk to the people who can give you that information to a good level. Diet tips to support your fertility journey. Um, so start your day with protein and fat rather than carbohydrate rich foods. We just talked about that. So I'm a proponent of doing something like eggs and avocado on a big salad versus a bowl of oatmeal. I have no problem with oatmeal, but typically I'll have people have that as more of an afternoon snack. Oats are really rich in amazing nutrients for fertility, but sometimes I'll have that shifted just to the afternoon to help regulate our blood sugar a little bit more making sure that we're having lots of healthy fats, tons of omega-3s, salmon, anchovies, mackerels. Those are some of my favorite. Pair carbohydrates with fat and protein. So when you are having a carbohydrate, typically I tell people, try to eat your protein and your fat first and then have that carb because it will regulate your blood sugar a little bit more. Continuing to eat regularly throughout the day and avoiding intermittent fasting. I know this one is huge for people, but when it comes to your hormone health, your body does not like fasting that long. 12 hours is going to be a good amount. And this is more for my females in here. Um, if for like your partners or whatever, they might be okay with doing uh, uh, fasting because that actually can help for them. But for a lot of the times for women, doing any kind of fasting is not really a good idea. Nutrient dense foods, so organ meats, eggs, like I mentioned, the salmon, anchovy, sardines, and mackerels, lots of leafy greens and vegetables, organic seaweeds, those are gonna be super helpful for your thyroid health, and nuts and seeds. And then trying to eat organic when possible. I say this because, oh, sorry, it's a little loud out there right now. Um, what ends up happening is oftentimes we have a lot of stuff that gets sprayed. We're taking that into our body that can impact our, our liver health, which can impact our hormone health. And when you conceive, um, it is really important to realize that 
all of this stuff can then show up in baby. And there's a lot more research that's coming out nowadays that's starting to show what's actually showing up in our baby, in the placenta, in the womb, what's coming up with babies that are born. Um, so knowing what you're putting in your body is really important. And then some foods to avoid. Refined carbs, alcohol, of course, um, especially, you know, if you are kind of in that post ovulation waiting to take a pregnancy test cycle, limiting your alcohol consumption can be really helpful. Reduce your caffeine intake. So try to swap that over to matcha or adding in maca instead. Certain oils, so canola oil, soybean, sunflower, safflower, corn oil, all good ones to avoid. Deep fried foods and then conventionally raised meat. So if you can, if you have the budget, organic, grass fed, pasture raised are always going to be better. They actually have omega threes in them, which are anti-inflammatory versus omega sixes, which are typically found in conventionally raised meats, uh, which are omega, oh, I already said omega sixes, that are omega sixes that are pro-inflammatory. So I mean, they cause more inflammation. Now let's dive into supplements. So I've actually broken this down, I believe into four categories from what I remember. Yes four categories because otherwise there's a ton that I could be recommending. So first I want to talk about antioxidant support because I think this is great for anyone across the spectrum, no matter what your hormone profile is looking like. Vitamin C. So I'm a big fan of the instant C effervescent from Organica right now. Um, it's like little tablets, a thousand milligrams of vitamin C. Typically I tell people you can take vitamin C up to bowel tolerance. So oftentimes people can take like 3000 a day and have no issues, but a thousand should be good enough for most people. Um, I like those ones, especially in the heat of summer right now, getting your water in is just as important. So it's a little tablet, you toss it in water, there's, it's sugar free um, and it just tastes pretty good. CoQ10, like I mentioned previously, CoQ10 is a really important one when we're talking about egg health. Um, oftentimes, if people are going through IVF, IUI treatments, uh, their doctor will recommend that they take a CoQ10 supplement. So adding that in can be great. Organic gelatinized maca powder. I am a maca fan through and through. Um, I recommend this to any of my clients that are trying to get pregnant because it does have such a traditional use and a lot of research that's being done on fertility health um, and, you know, egg health, hormone quality, hormone health, hormone balancing. So adding in something like a maca powder is one of my favorite ones to do. It's really easy to toss into something like a smoothie. Um, you can toss it in. Some people do it in their morning coffee. I don't love the taste it adds to it, but I love it in a smoothie. It adds like a slight caramelly sweetness. That's like my perspective. Everyone thinks it tastes different, but I personally love it in a smoothie. Zinc, so the chelated zinc from Organica. I often, again, zinc is a really potent antioxidant. When you are looking for antioxidant supplements, you're looking for vitamins A, C, E, zinc, and selenium, as well as krill oil. So krill oil um, would be that really good omega-3 fatty acid for you. Now, uh, with the, with the um, antioxidants, how I just mentioned it has A, C, E, zinc, and selenium. One thing I will recommend if you are someone who is taking like an antioxidant blend from someone else, um, make sure that when you do conceive, you do stop taking it because it can have a really high vitamin A content. And depending on the type of vitamin A that's in it, um, it may not be best for baby. Stress management. Uh, this is really good for those dealing with hormonal imbalances due to stress, lack of sleep, uh, inappropriate exercise routines. So adding something like an ashwagandha powder, ashwagandha, either powder or capsule. Um, ashwagandha is really well known and well studied nowadays for its impact on stress, on cortisol, um, on the cortisol. So that's our, our stress hormone, um, as well as our blood sugar regulation. So it can help with everything from blood sugar management to our stress hormone and how we actually perceive stress through the day. Magnesium bisglycinate. So in this case, it's Organica Serenity. Magnesium bisglycinate is a really good little relaxer for people. I typically will have clients take it in the evening in just like kind of a glass of water, have it as that nighttime ritual to start winding down, getting ready for bed. Uh, maca powder is another one that I've added in here too, because if you are someone that is dealing with really high stress, getting off the caffeine train is very important. 
So if we can get over to something like a maca powder, I sometimes will mix maca and cocoa powder or maca and cacao and add that with a little bit of maple syrup and then a little bit of whatever your favorite non-dairy milk is. Good to go. Liver support. So I add liver support in here because if you are someone dealing with that high estrogen, low progesterone issue, typically what we want to do is work on supporting our liver to be able to detoxify excess estrogen. So I have three of my favorite supplements here, milk thistle to support our liver health. So that kind of helps to give it more of a, helps to give it strength. It doesn't help necessarily to clear it out, but it helps to give it a bit of strength. NAC, so that's N-acetylcysteine. This is a precursor to something called glutathione. Glutathione is a very, very potent um, liver cleanser. So it is really important for our body to be utilizing something like NAC to convert to glutathione um, in order to actually help our liver to process everything. I also really like chlorella powder or capsules. Basically anything green is going to be helpful in order to support your liver health as well. When we're looking at foods even, like I love bitter greens, I love cruciferous vegetables. Um, so all of those are also going to be really helpful for your fertility journey too. PCOS support. So there's specific supplements out there nowadays that oftentimes will go along with PCOS. Um, you, someone will tell you, you know, you'll go to your doctor, you'll tell them you, you're dealing with PCOS, or so they'll diagnose you with it. And there's like, you will be given something like chromium and then myonositol nearly immediately, as well as vitamin D. Um, and sometimes you'll also be given magnesium as well, depending on what your issues are. Like if you're dealing with irregular or sorry, uh, painful periods, oftentimes you'll be given or recommended to take magnesium as well. So I recommend blood sugar control. So that is our, that's the one that includes chromium in there. So that helps with blood sugar management. Myo-inositol, um, that also helps with healthy metabolism, often will help with estrogen imbalances and helping with clearing out excess estrogen. Chelated zinc, again, this is really important as an antioxidant in order to support both our eggs as well as our hormone health. And then vitamin D3. Um, this one is coming up a lot more in, in PCOS support. Um, it's coming up as one of those things that is really necessary because oftentimes people are having really low vitamin D3 levels um, and they're not actually able to utilize what they're given. The other piece of PCOS support that's more of a lifestyle piece is if you have PCOS, having really good sleep cycles is really important and having some kind of regular system is really important because oftentimes what happens with those with PCOS um, is our clocks are actually shifted. So you're not able to, your cortisol isn't regulated as well as someone who does not have PCOS. Um, I've had people who are shift workers that also have PCOS and their symptoms are completely out of control, especially when they have long extended periods where their schedule is really off track. Off track. Um, other times when they go months on, on end where they actually have just daytime shifts, they notice that their symptoms start to actually kind of level out a little bit. So making sure that you have a really good sleep schedule is important. I wanted to really quickly touch on why I love also bone broth in fertility and pregnancy. So I wanted to quickly touch on a couple things just for pregnancy here. Um, for those who are going to get pregnant because we are going to work on our fertility. We are going to work on our hormone health. We're going to seek help from an external party if it's necessary. But when we look, when we look at fertility, according to TCM, bone broth actually bolsters our Jing, uh, which is known as a source of energy that's needed for high quality eggs and sperm. So this is great for males and females. Bone broth has also been used to strengthen our protective outer layer that can impact our immune system. So our immune health is really important. And what we're actually realizing, or not realizing, but we've known, um, but it's really being talked about, I think, a little bit more nowadays, is the impact that our, our uterus and our immune system work together. So making sure that we are protecting and giving that additional protection to our uterus is really important. During pregnancy, I really like it because our needs for an amino acid called glycine, actually also our protein intake, that needs are increased substantially. The actual amount isn't necessarily, um, isn't, hasn't been studied to a point where we know exactly how much we need. We just know we need a heck of a lot. 
So this really helps to support the placenta as well as your growing belly. And then I just did list off a couple of supplements to support your prenatal journey. So that's that time after you've conceived, because oftentimes we get a lot of questions um, about what I can and can't take while I'm pregnant. So instant C is one of my favorites. I should have added collagen on here, um, but MCT oil powder I really like as well. Magnesium citrate because bowel movements are going to be an issue. And then oftentimes um, things like blood sugar control, I would say speak to your healthcare practitioner before you have it. But if you're dealing with later stage gestational diabetes, this can be a little bit more supportive. And then I do have two recipes here. So if you wanted to just quickly screenshot these. Um, so we have the enhanced collagen powder parfait. Um, this one is another really good one, especially when we're talking about lower carbohydrate meals. So ones that are going to be a little bit more blood sugar regulating. Still getting amazing antioxidants from the berries. You're getting some protein from the collagen. Uh, you're also getting a little bit of protein from either the yogurt, if you're doing a, a normal dairy yogurt, or some healthy fats from the chia seed, and if you do something like a coconut yogurt. And then a Thai stew. So this one's a little bit more intricate. Definitely screenshot this one. Um, again, this one uses the beef bone broth. So going back to that glycine, going back to that immune support, all of those types of things that are going to be really helpful. You might not be using this one until the fall, just given how our heat situation is going right now. Um, but yeah, it's there for you just in case. And then Chia Ashwagandha Overnight Oats. Um, this one is a great, you can do it. Like I said, I typically will recommend if we're really dealing with crazy hormone imbalances, I typically will recommend people try to do more of something like this in the afternoon, or you can just do pure chia seed pudding with the ashwagandha and, and some of the banana or the berries in the morning instead. Um, but trying to keep this as an afternoon snack rather than going and grabbing like a muffin or some other kind of sweet treat. And this is where we start wrapping up. So um, definitely check out Nature's Fair. Um, and I think Melissa's well, gonna be joining us again. So now it's time for some questions. So good, so good, Rhiannon. Thank you so much. No problem. Um, oh, yeah, if there's anything we didn't, if we don't get to them today, obviously you can, I'm assuming, reach out to Nature's Fair. Um, but if there's any specific product questions that you really were dying to know, you can always reach out to care at organica.com or reach out to Organica on social at Organica Health. And that's where you can also find me as well if you want any more tips tricks like this. <laughs> Perfect. That sounds amazing. All right. Before we get into the questions, um, I do want to note that I put a sticky note at the top of our chat box with a link to the $5 coupon. So you can go to that link and that's where your coupon is. And I'll also email it out tomorrow as well once we upload this video so you can be able to watch this video at any point. All right. Ready to do a little bit of uh, rapid fire questions, Rhiannon? All right. Yes. <laughs> Heck yes. I like it. All right. First off, what are the optimal levels of testosterone and DHEA for fertility? I'm bad with specific levels because also when we're looking at it, it will depend on what we're looking at in terms of everything else in your body. Um, and I would say trying to get more of a fuller look at your hormone picture can be really helpful. If you have the budget for something like a urine test, that will be really ideal. Um, typically I think they run like 450. Um, otherwise going to your doctor and yeah, chatting with your, with your ND or your doctor about it just to, cause you'll be able to also look at typically like your estrogen levels as well. And I can't think of what it would be on a doctor's thing off the top of my head. So sorry about that. No, that's perfect. That's great. Um, any suggestions on what to do if testosterone is low in females? Weights, lift weights. Um, so oftentimes we, as females, we do cardio. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. I love cardio clearly, but if our testosterone is low, if we're dealing with hormone, any kind of hormone imbalances really, adding in more weights is going to be really, really helpful. Um, that can bump up your testosterone. That's also really helpful for men that are dealing with testosterone issues. 
weight training versus cardio. Good to know. Good to know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, next up, with endometriosis, is the pain always during your period or could it be throughout your entire cycle? It can be throughout your entire cycle. So some people have like minimal period pain, but then have ridiculous pain the rest of their cycle. Um, yeah, so it can kind of be any time. And oftentimes you can get testing done from your doctor. Sometimes they actually will have to do a bit more invasive searching for you. Um, but yeah, they'll be able to kind of talk to you about it, but also advocate for yourself a lot because I will say that there's sometimes, especially with endometriosis, where it does get overlooked for a really long time. Yes. Yeah. You can tell it's here because there's a, a few other questions on endometriosis as well. Oh, okay. Um, do endometriosis cause headaches and brain fog? If it's, if we're talking about headaches and brain fog in conjunction with like period pain, I would say it's probably more likely like, and it's not severe, severe period pain or severe pain throughout the entire month in your pelvic region. Um, you're not really having pain with intercourse. It might be more likely that you're dealing with an estrogen dominance issue. Because oftentimes, like, headaches are pretty common when it comes to just general hormone imbalances. Like, people will get those, like, period migraines. Well, look, it's kind of pms -y. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, all right. Here's another one. What do you think of Receptiva DX for endometriosis? I actually not totally sure what that is. Um, I will say my knowledge, like I'm going to be fully transparent here. My knowledge of endometriosis is pretty high level um, because I don't work with a ton of clients on that because typically those are get referred directly over to a naturopathic doctor instead. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, any suggestions? So this lovely lady is in Saskatoon. Um, she's looking for a good naturopathic doctor. Mm -hmm. So any, any resources? I mean, I know Saskatoon is a little bit of a, out of our region, but is there a, a website we can direct her to? I, I would say like Google, Google Saskatoon naturopathic doctor and check your Google reviews because those are going to be some of your best bets for that. Um, also ask around with your friend groups because normally like the clinic that I work at, I'm going to say most of it's based on referrals of people just having excellent experiences and passing that on. So yeah, chat around with your friend groups, post on Facebook even. Oftentimes I'll, I'll see people in Toronto posting because being from Toronto, they'll post something about I need an ND in this area and there'll be like 20 people will, will respond. So if you're on any kind of social media, that's a great tool. Perfect. All right. So we have the supplements and the, the powders that we can add to our smoothies. Um, any suggestions on what type of fruit or veggies that we can throw in a smoothie for a, a quick hit in the breakfast morning? <laughs> well, number one, my favorite would be, and this is a weird one, but um, steamed then frozen cauliflower. Now, the reason I say this is because number one, cauliflower is going to be absolutely excellent for as a cruciferous vegetable for your liver health. Plus, it adds in a little bit more thickness um, and then adding something like berries because they are a little bit lower in carbohydrates, some organic spinach if possible, because again, we want lo lots of those leafy greens. And again, the leafy greens and the cruciferous vegetables are also going to be high in folate, which is something that we definitely really want to be having pre-pregnancy and during that pregnancy period. Cool. Those are some of your and protein powder. So something like, you know, either, either doing a protein powder, if you really like one, um, or using something like collagen powder can be really helpful too. Gotcha. All right. Next up is Maca the same thing as ashwagandha. No, so both of them are adaptogens, um, which means that they help your body to basically find homeostasis, find balance. Both of them are also actually roots. <laughs> so they're both herbs, which is great. Um, but when we're looking at ashwagandha, typically we relate that more back to that, that cortisol, that stress management, and then maca is seen as fertility. Ashwagandha is a little bit more um, easily accessible country to country, but maca comes specifically from the Andes. So it's historically been used kind of in that area a little bit more too. Yeah. You, can, gotcha. so you can use them still together um, or you can use them separately. And they definitely taste different. Ashwagandha is very bitter. Uh, maca is a little bit more 
sweet, like I said, in my opinion. Gotcha. Um, you were speaking, so I missed this as well. You were speaking of an Organica product that carried a lot of vitamin A. Do you happen to remember which product that was? Yeah, it wasn't specifically an Organica product, but it's any time if someone's taking like a, just an antioxidant blend. So there's often times where because we want, you know, we all care about COVID right now. We want our immune system to be really strong, really healthy. Oftentimes people are taking an antioxidant supplement, but typically that will have vitamin A, C, E, um, selenium, and zinc. So we want to just usually cut that back once we do get pregnant because we don't want to have too much vitamin A, especially in the synthetic form. Um, because it can impact your, 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 your baby. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, can you explain the difference between vitamin D and vitamin D3? Yes. Um, well, there's D2 versus D3. So D2 is going to be a form that your body still needs to convert. Um, D3 is more bioavailable by your body. Um, D3 typically will come from an animal source. There's there I think I think there's vegan sources out there nowadays, um, but oftentimes you will see that it does come from animal source. So just kind of keeping that in mind when you do go to grab a supplement, if you are plant based, know to check for that. Uh, but oftentimes I try to have people take a D three because it's going to be better for it's going to be more absorbable and used by your body. Gotcha. Um, why do you recommend we switch from dairy products? Okay, so that one, that one's a bit of a loaded one. Um, <laughs> I don't necessarily recommend that you do. I just have oftentimes clients, when we deal with inflammation, um, cow's dairy specifically has some proteins that can be more inflammatory in our body versus, you know, even like goat's milk or goat's dairy, sheep's dairy, those ones have, aren't as inflammatory in our body. So even if we're not switching from cow's dairy, I'll often have people switch over to goats or sheep's milk options. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to even say this, but like oftentimes people also will do unpasteurized cheeses and dairies. Um, and that actually is really high in nutrients, but that's very, very hard to find, especially if you're looking for milk, because I don't actually think that's legal. Um, <laughs> so oftentimes if you guys dive into any of those like traditional books for, for pregnancy, fertility, you'll see them talk about more unpasteurized products but just know that's going to be very, very hard to find. So oftentimes I'll just have people swap over to goats or sheep's dairy because that's going to be a little bit less inflammatory for people. And then especially if you're someone that deals with like really bad period cramps, um, really weird hormones, breast, breast tenderness, swollen breasts when you are getting your period, making that swap over to non-dairy products in total can be really helpful for some people. And PCOS as well. PCOS definitely, there's a lot of people that see major benefits by cutting out dairy. Gotcha. All right, and thanks for uh, encouraging us to break the law as well. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, don't tell anybody that. <laughs> okay, it's our secret. <laughs> uh, next up, the difference between collagen and bone broth, do they do the same thing in terms of supplements? So they are pretty similar to be totally honest. Um, they both have a very similar amino acid profile. Um, they're going to both have glycine, they have glutamine, which is really great for your gut health, your gut lining. Um, they're both going to be really high in protein. Um, I do think, though, if I'm thinking about the chicken bone broth powder and the beef bone broth powder compared to the collagen, I believe that the bone broths have about five grams more protein than the collagens do. But you're going to use them very differently. Uh, collagen is unflavored, so you can toss it really easily into something like your coffee or a smoothie versus a bone broth. Both have a bit of a flavor. The beef one I find easy to kind of toss into things like a smoothie, um, but the chicken one definitely use it for soups, use it with your rice. Um, you can cook it like that. It's a little bit different. Gotcha. Um, this next question is a, a little bit hard to answer, and I'm sure you're just going to say speak to your doctor or and D, but uh, when is it too late to conceive at, at what age? I'd say like the latest to conceive is once you've gone through menopause is kind of that like, that is too late. Uh, but oftentimes, yeah, talking to your, your medical professional can be really helpful because doing some hormone testing, you might realize you might still be like 45 and 
totally, your estrogen levels are totally normal. It's totally easy for you to conceive. You're not even going through perimenopause yet. So definitely talk to your medical professional. There have been cases of people going to their OB thinking that they were going through menopause and it turned out they were pregnant. <laughs> Can you imagine that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So really I'd say like the very latest that you know, you will not conceive is the one year after you have stopped getting your period. Okay. That ties in nicely. Can I still get pregnant if I'm experiencing perimenopause? Yes. If you are getting your period and you are ovulating, you can get pregnant. But knowing when you ovulate is important. So if you if you know that, typically you can, yeah, yeah, just structure your day differently or structure your month a little bit. Um, next up is uh, any thoughts on the saliva versus urine test for hormones? Yeah. Um, I often will have people do the urine test just because that's the one I, I often like, yeah, we use more often because it does give you the, the full spectrum of the day. As long as you are taking one that can give you multiple points during the day, that's really important. Um, if you can do like with the Dutch test is specifically the one that I usually will have people do doing it at yeah those multiple points. So you can actually see where your cortisol, where your estrogen, where your progesterone is at through the day, that cortisol is key to so getting those multiple points. Both of them are going to be a little bit better than a blood test because a blood test is really just that one time situation. Okay. Um, as a vegetarian, is there foods that I should stay away from or focus on in order to be able to conceive? As a vegetarian, 100% eggs eggs are going to be huge. Um, they have a ton of choline. They're excellent when it comes to your fertility health as well as pregnancy. Um, and then again, the, lots of those cruciferous vegetables are going to be really great. And just making sure that like as a vegetarian, um, it can still be really easy for you to get all those nutrients that you need. Just avoiding, you know, if, if you're looking at non-GMO tofu, totally fine to add tempeh, things like that, but maybe trying to avoid some of those fake meats. Um, trying to not get too heavy on the refined carbohydrates, the canola oil. So just watching what oils are being used in certain products that you have. Because oftentimes a lot of the vegetarian, um, like mock products will have more inflammatory oils. So just watching for that too. Okay. Yeah, definitely eggs and, and lots of vegetables. Okay. And beans. <laughs> All good. <laughs> <laughs> and then beans are already a, a staple of a vegetarian diet. <laughs> Um, this lovely lady here has been tracking her estrogen, estrogen and LH through Myra and test strips for months and rarely sees her LH peak. Um, any thoughts on specific things to do to balance that or is this a red flag? Yeah, so there's a couple questions I probably have for that and I'll just put them out there. But um, number one, is it like are you normally, are you getting a normal period every month? And are you actually tracking at the right times? Um, so if you're tracking every single day and doing a test strip every single day throughout the month and still not getting anything, then I'd say that's a case you probably want to touch base with, with your healthcare practitioner. Um, because if you aren't ovulating, then we also will need to actually get you ovulating and to see why you are not if you're actually not ovulating or if you're just maybe missing it. Some, there are cases for certain people where, if you're tracking once a day, I know you said multiple times, um, but it, for people that are maybe tracking once, it's really easy for them to miss it, especially if they have a super quick um, little spike in their LH levels. But I definitely say yeah, if you if you notice that you're testing it multiple times a day and you know that you're getting it around that ovulation um, or what should be your ovulation window, then I definitely say chat with the chat with a healthcare practitioner, or if you have very irregular cycles, it might just be that you're not hitting the right time too. Okay. And uh, last question, should we take vitamin D with K2? Yeah, there's no harm in like, not that there's no harm in it, it is more beneficial. Um, so I do tell people if you can, but oftentimes people will also just take a vitamin D3 supplement on their own. But oftentimes people will tell them like taking a D3 to K2 at the same time can be helpful just for the absorption. Awesome. That's it. Last uh, last call for questions. If anybody else has any questions, oh, oh, there's um. This was mm -hmm. the the LH peak. Yes, regular periods and track for almost fourteen days. 
Yeah, I'd say it could be a good case to chat with your healthcare practitioner and just to see. Um, they might be able to kind of do a bit of an ultrasound or do some testing to see if, you're, if you are ovulating or not. Perfect. Well, Rhiannon, thank you so very much. I, we love having you. We would have you every day if we could. <laughs> just a wealth of knowledge and we appreciate it. And for those that listen tonight, don't forget you have your coupon that is in the message area, but I'll also email this out as well as a recording of this presentation tomorrow. So as always, thank you very much and uh, we'll see you in the stores. Take care, everybody. Goodbye. Bye, everyone.